All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and welcome to PHMC's Virtual Collections Showcase for the month of February 2021. Uh, this month's theme is love and relationships, seeing as we're only two days away from Valentine's Day. Uh, I think most of you are hopefully familiar with this by now. If this is your first time tuning in, we have uh, six panelists from six of our different uh, Trails of History sites. They will be presenting an object from the collection at that site that uh, is related to that theme of love and relationships. They will have five minutes to tell us all about it and make the case as to why that object or collection piece best exemplifies the theme. And then at the end, all of the attendees will have opportunity to vote for their favorite. Uh, the winner will get bragging rights along with this nifty uh, PHMC championship belt. And uh, the opportunity to host and or uh, decide on the theme of a future program uh, as we move forward throughout the year. We are hoping to uh, have this program once a month. I will give a quick shout out for March's program. Uh, we don't have an exact date yet but it will likely be the week between March the 7th and March the 12th, and the theme will be birthdays and celebrations. So uh, put a mental post-it note uh, on your calendar for that uh, second week, week of March and uh, watch the uh, social media and websites of our various sites uh, for the official announcement when the time comes. So to begin, I'm going to have all of our panelists uh, introduce themselves, uh, tell us who they are, what site they're representing, and uh, since it's two days away from Valentine's Day, if you want to uh, give a quick anecdote, anecdote about a memorable Valentine's Day experience uh, that is at least PG related. Uh, I'm gonna go around the screen. I will just uh, call on people in the order that I see them on my screen. So that would be uh, Sarah Buffington first. Hi. I'm Sarah Buffington. I'm from Old Economy Village in um, Ambridge, Pennsylvania. And I, I, you put us on the spot. I don't know. <laughs> I had a good Valentine's Day on Sunday, though. <laughs> it was very nice. That's all you need to say. Perfect. Uh, next is, on my uh, Brady Bunch windows is uh, Melanie. Everyone, uh, my name is Melanie Hay. I'm a volunteer with Historic Hope Lodge in Fort Washington. And like Sarah, I, I don't have anything immediately to contribute um, as far as a memorable Valentine's Day. I just know we had lots of chocolate. Um, one of the chocolates we bought was from Sheen's, Sheen's Confectionery in Philadelphia over the weekend, which is a popular spot down on Market Street. Thanks. Nice. Thanks. Uh, next, let's go with uh, Jen Royer. Hello, I'm Jennifer Warrior from Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum. And in my house, we are actually more excited for today than Valentine's Day, because today is Falschnacht Day here in Pennsylvania, German County. Yeah, I, I miss Falschnacht so much. They're not such a big thing up here in, in the northern tier of PA. It's very hard to find them. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right in the heart of it. So congratulations. <laughs> Uh, next, I have uh, Josh Fox. Hi, yes, I'm Josh Fox. I'm the curator of the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. And uh, probably memorable of our times is everyone that I get to spend with my wife. And it has nothing to do with the fact that she's tuned into this presentation. <laughs> I'm saying that of my own free will. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. But, no. So when it comes time for voting, you've got an ace in the hole. <laughs> Nice. There may or may not be a few foxes on this. Uh, on this. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Uh, Gotta stack it. Stack it. <laughs> let's go with Linda next. Hi, I'm Linda Bola from the Erie Maritime Museum, and uh, I always think about Valentine's Day and cut out cookies. You know, from the time our kids were young, we always frosted them with pink frosting, and it's a great memory. Of course, our kids are a little older now and not coming home to bake with me anymore, so we don't make those cookies quite as often. Very nice. I can taste the cookies now. <laughs> and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mary Ellen. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Ellen Coons. I'm the museum educator at Pensbury Manor in Morrisville, Pennsylvania. 
and Valentine's Day was never a big deal in our house. Um, the 15th was better because that's when all the chocolate was half off. So um, that's what we, but this, this Valentine's Day, we had something very special happen in our family. Um, my lovely niece, Elena, got engaged. So congratulations to Elena. Congratulations. All right, that would certainly be a memorable Valentine's Day. All right, well, uh, welcome to all the panelists. Thank you for uh, participating as always. Uh, you may have heard us discussing earlier, we are going to go in alphabetical order by site name, uh, which uh, lets us start with Erie Maritime Museum. So uh, before we begin, I did have a Q&A. Uh, Susan was wondering, uh, she says she signed in but does not see herself on camera. Uh, Susan, this is a webinar. So all of the attendees video is turned off. You will only see myself and the uh, six panelists tonight. Nothing, nothing wrong with your, your video. So I hope that answers that. Uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat and I will do my best to get to them. If they're related to the artifacts, we are going to, you can type them anytime, but uh, we are gonna hold off on asking them until everyone has had a chance to go. So with that, Linda, uh, whenever you are ready. Okay, can you see the screen now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. There we go. That should be it. Is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, hi, I'm going to talk today about one of our little hidden treasures at the Maritime Museum. Um, this is a song sheet that was printed in 1814, there, thereabouts. It's currently part of a virtual exhibit on the Erie Maritime Museum's website. Uh, when it was originally acquired, it was acquired for the celebratory songs about the Battle of Lake Erie, but who could have known there was such a sweet love story inside? Song sheets, um, with, along with very popular broadside ballads, were all printed quickly and cheaply uh, on cheap paper. They were sold cheaply, so everyone could learn the songs and could entertain themselves by singing what was then the latest hits. Uh, these were printed with lyrics, but no musical notation. So how did they know the melody? Well, such song sheets often included the suggestion that the lyrics were sung to some other well-known tune. And this is the case of William of the Fairy. Well-known well melodies were often reused using new lyrics to tell a new story or to celebrate current events. Author the, uh, authors of our lyrics are seldom acknowledged. So um, you can see an image here of our, um, uh, an old, old image of William of the Fairy and we've transcribed it so that you can read the story a little bit better. So in the first verse, the song's story takes place on the River Clyde, the second longest river in Scotland. Our young maid is happy because she's in love and she's beloved by William of the Fairy. She of course is worthy of love uh, as she's chaste and a pure mind and is content living a humble life with her parents. William proves worthy of her love as he's a hardworking man. A ferryman roves goods and people from one side of the river to the other all day. The labors of his day are forgotten, however, because William spends his evenings happy at the home of his beloved. Now her parents consent to the marriage with William and a date is set, but before they could marry, William is carried off by a press gang. For those of you who are not familiar with naval history, a press gang goes about seizing men for service in the Navy. During this period, it's the British Navy. It's true that William may never see his love again. England is at war with Napoleon in Europe, as well as with the United States. Should he survive? 
who knows where in the world he'll end up. True love will not be denied, however. A windstorm kicks up and the boat, along with the gang of ruffians, is sunk. Our brave hero can swim and he safely reaches his own boat, the wherry from which he was seized. Our song ends happily with William and his beloved Jane reunited. Now the tune, all about the tune. Uh, William of the Fairy was quite popular around 1814 and remained so. Published lyrics for this song appear in musical volumes well into the 19th century. Unfortunately, our copy doesn't reference the melody but with some sleuthing, I was able to find a copy that did at the National Library of Scotland. Fortunately, William of the Fairy is sung to the tune of Sweet Lass of Richmond Hill, a song which remains popular in England today. The tune was composed by a very prolific James Hook, organist at Marleybone Gardens, then at Vauxhall Gardens for over 50 years. He composed over 2000 songs one of his tunes that we Americans might remember is Well Away Cool Barbara Allen. This was popularized again by Joan Baez in the 1960s. So um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank David Koch in London, webmaster and co-author for the Vauxhall uh, Gardens website and an excellent book. Uh, with his assistance in uh, finding that elusive copy of the lyrics that mentions the melody. Now, if you'll bear with me, I will uh, make an attempt to play that melody for you. There we go. Okay, with that, um, we'll leave you with the melody. Uh, we can certainly send a transcription to anyone who's interested and uh, let you know where that tune can be found on the internet. Thank you so much for allowing me to present this hidden treasure. All right. Thank you very much, Linda. And as uh, Amy said, we, I can hear everyone at home uh, singing along right now. So <clears throat> maybe that can be the uh, next challenge for Erie Maritime Museum's uh, Facebook page is the William of the Ferry sing-along video contest. So <laughs> I won't patent that. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, and uh, Linda, feel free uh, as each of you go, uh, if you would like to put your site's uh, web link to a donation page uh, in the chat, uh, you are welcome to do so. Uh, you can look for that while the, the person after you is, is going, or those of you that have yet to go, if you want to get that ready, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to drop that in the chat. Uh, as always, uh, this uh, program is being brought to you free of charge. Uh, all of our sites uh, do have uh, private 501c organizations uh, that could most uh, certainly make use of any donations that you would like to give if you are able. Uh, so again, look in the chat, uh, and, and those uh, do donation links will be coming throughout the program. Uh, so with that, uh, Melanie at Hope Lodge is next on the list alphabetically. So.
So Melanie, whenever you are ready. All right, thanks Tasha, everyone. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and I know our theme, oh, one second here, bear with me, hold on. Ah. I don't know if I am. Can you see my screen now? Hold on one second. Yes. But I don't want it to do that. One moment, please. <laughs> one sec. I apologize. One second. I just had it. There we go. Don't worry. Uh, quietly sing William of the Fairy to ourselves. <laughs> All right, I got. Let's see here. All right, let me share this. Hmm. All right. Can you see it now? Not. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. We did before. There it is. There it is. Okay. I just want to make sure you can see the whole thing here. There we go. How about that? Is that good? That's perfect. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. All right, so everyone, thank you so much. So I know tonight's theme is more about love and relationships. Um, I'm going to be focusing more on heartbreak of uh, Samuel Morris, who was the builder and owner of Hope Lodge. Um, so basically, we're going to be talking about whether it's myth or reality, the story I'll share with you tonight. So, uh, once upon a time, there was a Quaker gentleman named Samuel Morris who built a large mansion. He named it White Marsh Estate, though it would later be called Hope Lodge. You see, very little is known about Samuel's personal life. There's no journals nor any letters for friends or relatives were ever found, other than his property ledgers and a law book that we have in our collection, which you'll see on the right-hand side. There is nothing else that would shed light on the way Samuel lived or loved. It is said that Samuel once built, at, well, excuse me, was once engaged and built a home as large as White Marsh Estate, intending to share it with a wife and family. Was he engaged to a lovely young lady he met on a trip to England, or to a Philadelphia girl of good family, or was it neither? This is one of the many mysteries that enlivens the story of the property. Though we don't have any pictures of Samuel or his unknown slash non-existent fiance, Again, we don't know whether this is true or not true. We're just guessing at this point. But we uh, are showing this photo on the right because it might be a representation of what Samuel and his intended might have worn during their courtship. On the left-hand side, you'll just see the building of um, the Hope Lodge. There was a Works Progress Administration um, survey plans from 1936. So uh, you're going to also see on the right-hand side some Par a parlor space and a space in the bedroom where Samuel Morris may have had the following uh, conversation. So legend has it that Samuel apparently made a very careless remark about someone who may or may not have been his fiance. After construction of the mansion was complete and he was imbibing with friends at perhaps one of these spaces in the mansion, uh, at his housewarming gathering, he was to have said, I've got the pen, all I want now is the sow. Now, whether this remark was heard directly by his intended at the party or repeated back to her in England by someone else, we will never know for sure. But in either case, the engagement was broken. Alas, for 22 years, Samuel lived as a bachelor in his mansion, having never married. Samuel Morris died on November 30th, 1770 at the age of 61. In 1753, an anonymous poet traveled directly past White Marsh Estate and he recorded the woeful tale of Samuel Morris's heartbreak in verses entitled Journey from Philadelphia to Bethlehem, 1753. And if you look to the right, this is the poem here, and I'm going to move a few things so I can see it. And as I go through the poem, I am going to read it. Um, I will try not to um, go too fast <laughs> or too slow, but basically um, you can choose for yourself whether you think this actually speaks to Samuel Morris um, based on the language in the poem. We feel that it, it was about him, uh, but again, this whole story may or may not be true. So again, that's up to the visitors of Hope Lodge to decide for themselves. Hence our way to fair White Marsh we came, White Marsh the mansion of the Morris name, where the high hill its humble temple shows and throw the veil where the Wissahickon flows. 
But lo, what lofty structures yonder rise, or look the plain and tower to the skies. Yet why is there such a solitude profound? Why hangs a hovering melancholy round? Fair Amaryllis, fairest of the plain, the grave immense were loved, but loved in vain. It still found hope, thy unhappy swain deceives, still flattering love thy fair, the fairest prospect gives. For her the spring its earliest bloom prepares, for her the bark inscriptive letter was wears, for her alone these lofty structures rise and art with nature to attract her lies. Mistaken swain, too late, alas, you'll prove that globes and groves and fountains are the seats of love. For thee, though nature lavish all her stores, and peace and plenty smile round thy doors, ah, what avail thy rural wide domains, thy flowery meadows and thy fertile plains? What all the plenty that thy harvest boasts, what all the treasures of Peruvian coasts, while restless woe usurps these happy seats, and disappointed love each joy defeats? These scenes but serve each torment to renew, the hapless owner sickens at the view. In rooms of state his cruel lot bemoans, and lofty chambers echo to his groans. Or lonesome stalks in a deserted hall, while sighs repentant whisper round the wall. Touched with such woe, we, thy, we the sad scene forsook, and with a hick and cross thy crystal brook. It's a fairly sad <laughs> a poem about Samuel Morris. The good news is that there were four other families that lived at Hope Lodge uh, during the um, years of, excuse me, from 1770s through the 1950s. At the top, you have William and Mary West. You have on the, down in the middle, it's a James and Anna Watmau. To the bottom left is Jacob and Catherine Wentz. And to the right were our last private owners, William and Alice Dane. Thank you so much from the Friends of Hope Lodge, and we do hope to see you soon. All right, very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, it, it turned out a little better for William of the Ferry than it did for Samuel Morris. So. It certainly did. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, again, if you, if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat now or save them for the end. Uh, we are going to continue with our presentations uh, alphabetically. Uh, next on the list is Landis Valley Museum. So uh, Jennifer, whenever you are ready. No other love in the world is like the love a father has for his daughter and his daughter has for him. This love is similar, whether it is the 1880s, you live in Landis Valley, and you are Nettie Landis doted on by your father, Henry Landis, because you are often sick and born 10 years after your brother George, making you the baby of the family. Or it's 2020, you are healthy, again the baby of the family, but living through the strange times of COVID-19, so your father always makes sure you are happy and healthy. The father-daughter love takes many forms. Often in Pennsylvania German households, it can be seen in establishing an Alshire or dowry for your children. An Alshire was the Pennsylvania German's way of getting their children, males and females, off to a good start. This blanket chest, which entered the Landis Valley collection in 2009, is not the most beautiful chest in the collection with well-known Pennsylvania German paint and decorations. It was not made by the famous blanket chest decorators of the Ronk and Seltzer families. However, it is a strong example of a well-documented Lancaster County Amish Ashtire or dowry chest and shows the love an old order Amish father and minister had for his daughter. Inscribed on the underside of the lid of the till box mounted inside is the ownership of this blanket chest written in pencil. The first entry signed by the initial owner, Sarah B. Fisher, states that her father, Benjamin L. Fisher, made this chest for her when she was 16 years old. He died in 1904, November the 25th, aged 66 years, five months, 24 days. Gone but not forgotten, Sarah. 
Sarah wrote this entry after her father passed away while feeling the significance of him making the chess for her at least eight years earlier. Sarah also got married approximately one month after her father died. That means that the chest was then moved, filled with useful articles collected over the years from her father's house to her own household, giving her the good start her father had prepared for her before he died. This might have also been when the decorations were added to the front around Sarah's initials and the year her father made the chest for her. The bouquet on the left has the words, forget me not, in the center and the bouquet on the right has yours forever in the center. Sarah protected the chest throughout her life and then ensured that it was passed on to family members that understood the significance of it. The inscriptions continue stating that the chest was given to Sarah's son, Samuel, in 1930, then her granddaughter, Sarah M. Fisher Stolfus, in 1976, and then her great-granddaughter, Martha Stolfus Byler. This means that Benjamin's love for his daughter, Sarah, was passed on and felt all the way down to his great-great-granddaughter, Martha. Remember, a father holds his father's hand for a short, short while, but he holds her heart forever. This love is even more significant and pronounced when you can see it in a physical object like the Benjamin and Sarah Fisher 1896 blanket chest. By the way, that's Henry and Nettie Landis again in that photograph. Thank you. All right, very nice. Thank you. Reset my timer here. That's a terrific story and a terrific piece. Uh, next, alphabetically, we have Old Economy Village. So, Sarah. Hi. I'm going to share part, um, hold on a second. All right. So we have the story of encoded love letters within a celibate society. For those of you that don't know, Old Economy Village was the home of the Harmony Society. And yes, they were celibate. Um, but later on in, um, in the 19th century, they started to hire um, people that were not members of the Harmony Society, and they could um, have, they could be married, they could have children, um, and that's who our story is about. So, um, at Christiana Kroll came to America at the age of nine when, um, in 1880. She came to economy with her family. She was the oldest of seven children. And then um, Fred, Frederick Knadler came in um, 1883 and he was 15 years old. So just shortly after Frederick came to America, he, um, everyone in the town had to come together to fight a fire. And it wasn't enough for the fire pumper to put out a fire. Everyone had to come together and um, do a bucket brigade to put out the fire. So the day afterwards, they would go and collect their fire buckets. And um, so that's how these two met. So they were fighting over the same fire bucket. And um, they said, that's mine. No, that's mine. So the two met. So then um, later they, they met at um, different choir practices. It was called the Gomishton Choir. Mission Corps, the mixed choir, where men and women could sing together. So they, they got to know each other and started to be really good friends. Um, and then they started to fall in love. So uh, this was not looked upon that greatly by the leader, Jacob Henrici. And he, um, he, was, he kind of discouraged people getting together, just like the harmonists. Um, you weren't supposed to be together. So the hired workers were sort of being um, treated like, like the members of the Harmony Society. So Christiana and Fred figured out a coded way to write to each other. And you can see that in this letter. This is the first letter Christiana wrote to um, Frederick. 
and um, it's the first one we have. And so you can see it's a, a system of numbers that stand in for letters. Well, you, you probably can't read this very well either because it is, um, it's all an old German script. Well, it's not so old. I mean, I could read a little bit of it, but you can see the next letter here. Here's the code. It's very simple. A, E, I, O, U are one through five. And then I don't know how they picked the other letters, but it's L, M, N, and R. So you can actually figure these letters out. We did that just by looking at them. And then um, you'll also see like down here, there's all these O's and that is just standing in for the person's name. Like they, they don't have enough numbers for the letters. So they just make it stand in. So anyway, you can see also down below that there's some English in there as well. And then a little later on, this is 1888. Um, they're starting to put in die cuts into the, um, into the letters. You can see it's, it's still all um, coded letters. And then in this letter, there was also this little card that came in with it. It says, oh, take my heart and give me thine. True well remain till life's decline. This next letter is just beautiful. They, um, Christiana cut this out herself and decorated it all with pen and ink. And um, you can see the beautiful die cut up above, but it's still all in 100% German coded letters. And you can see she even really made the, the envelope pretty fancy. Um, this one is from August 1888. It's 70% coded in German um, with some English poems. So this one says, take my love greeting, though far, far away, I think of you ever by night and by day. Here's one from November of 1888 and they scribbled, Christiana scribbled something in the upside down at the top of the letter. It says, my dear sweetheart, if I had wings, I would now fly to you. Come to my arms, I will kiss you dear. And finally, we have our first letter that we have in the collection from Frederick. This is when he, um, he moved to California at, um, probably the insistence of one of the harmonists, probably to get the two separated. So um, he's going off to California to see the world, to see the country. And he's writing to Christiana and it's only about 1% encoded German. So I don't know if he had as much patience as Christiana did, but he's telling her about the trip to California. So there's all these different places in between. You see Chicago and things like that in there. And they're always talking about, about flowers. So this one letter uh, from Frederick to Christiana has the die cut up above that says, and above it, it says, a rose for my dear. And then below it, it says, yes, my dear, this is a rose for you, my dear, dear darling. If you were here, you could see such roses by us in a garden. <clears throat> but the rest is all in, in German, but there's no secret code. So, but you could also see there's some letters that were inserted in one of the letters, um, some flowers. And they're always talking about flowers. One of the letters talks about, um, she sent seeds to Frederick in California. And she said, you can plant these and whenever it starts blooming, you can pick them and know that they're from me. This was a really beautiful card that was sent for, um, New Year's Day, and it's, it has a poem in German. It has a little bit of coding in it. And there, there's all of these little cards that are inserted in uh, here and there. But here's the last letter that we have in the collection from them, and there's no German, there's no coding at all. So the two were finally married October 1st, 1890. And you can see the two of them there. There's Christiana and Fred. He was the um, town constable. And then that's them at their house, um, which is today's mecha mechanics building. That's um, them and their four children. 
But one reason why they might have had the coding was because of the um, her her six younger siblings. They probably couldn't read it, and they would write in English whenever whenever they were <laughs> whenever they didn't want someone to know something. So thank you. Got to keep those prying eyes away. <laughs> yes, definitely. All right, very cool. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, moving right along, uh, Mary Ellen, Pensbury Manor. Okay, well, um, in thinking about romance and relationships, I um, was thinking, and especially since my niece got engaged, I was just thinking about, you know, just what a bride chooses to wear on her wedding day just really sums up love and, and relationship. So let me share my screen here. And so yes, we're going to do Say Yes to the Dress, Colonial Edition. And um, so let's take a look at this object. And it is a quilted petticoat that was worn by a young woman, 18 years old. Um, her name was um, Phoebe Kirkbride. And this was worn on her wedding day in 1706. And just, you know, a little background, putting it into context. Um, let's talk about the bride and the groom. Phoebe was born in 1688 um, to Joseph and Phoebe Kirkbride. Her father came to America as an indentured servant at the age of 19 and became a prominent preacher, legislator, and land donor. So Phoebe grew up quite comfortably, except when her, um, her mother died when Phoebe was 13. Um, her father remarried quickly and her stepmother died when Phoebe was 15. Um, her father married yet again for a third time and that marriage lasted a little bit longer. Um, the connection to Pensbury Manor, um, not only is it the right time period, but um, two of Phoebe's brothers married the daughters of two of Penn's servants, John and Mary Sacher. Um, and they were all members of the Quaker meeting. So that's the bride on May 1st. And um, I did 20 minutes of exhaustive research on John Hutchinson, the groom, and came up with very little. I, I can't tell you that much about him. But when you know, when you're watching Say Yes to the Dress, it's not about the groom. It has nothing to do with the groom. It's all about the bride. So let's move on. So here we are. Um, this is a painting from the time period, just about the time that they would be getting married. And it shows some of the fashion. And this is maybe a step above where Phoebe um, and John would be in terms of, of social position. But the styles, maybe not as fine fabric, but it's going to be the same styles. And I want to focus in on this lady right here. And if you look carefully, she is wearing a quilted petticoat. And um, as you can see, it becomes part of that, that ensemble. The whole idea of a wedding gown, you know, that there's a dress that you have just for your wedding, really is, does not exist at this time period. You're just wearing really nice clothes. So um, you're wearing a gown, over the petticoat. You can see that the gown covers most of the petticoat. Um, the petticoat also has elaborate or quilting down here. And here's another gown from the time period. And you can see this elaborate embroidery. So this elaborate decoration at the bottom of your petticoat. By the way, I should mention that petticoat um, was basically a skirt. It could be worn underneath another petticoat, but basically it's a skirt. So it's not an undergarment. It's meant to be seen. Here's a black and white picture and it shows you um, the quilting involved in this. Um, again, you can see this elaborate quilting on the bottom, the crisscross. Here's a diagram of it. Um, for those of you who are interested in the 
details are it's made out of silk satin so this is really expensive fabric for phoebe um it's got pressed wool inside it's quilted the original drawstring waist was reset with a band at some point during its history the original pocket slits there were slits cut in the seams so that the bride could um put her hand through the petticoat and into her pocket, which is a separate garment. So they're the only two changes to this um, petticoat from 1706, which is really remarkable. Now, Phoebe got married and, and the petticoat changed hands. It just went from one generation to the next and stayed within the same family, which is remarkable. And the legend is that Phoebe made this for her wedding day. And it's a lovely story and it could absolutely be true. Recent scholars question if it wasn't ready to wear because quilted petticoats were so common and they were, um, they were just a part of your wardrobe. Everybody had them and they were easy to purchase we don't think about ready to wear in the late 17th, early 18th century, but you could buy them. Here's a detail of the um, bottom, that elaborate quilting pattern and comparing it again to what the entire ensemble looked like. Phoebe and John got married. Um, I'm not sure how long either of them lived. Um, John did quite well he, when he uh, wrote his will in 1740. He had extensive lands and extensive money, so she continued to live a comfortable lifestyle. But this object is the beginning. It it's, talks about a young woman, 18 years old, excited about her wedding day, whether she made it by hand or whether she went out and bought it, this was truly exciting for her, something that she told her children and her grandchildren about and the story handed down through generations. All right, and a good story it is. Thank you very much, Marianne. So uh, that brings us to our last presenter of the evening. That's uh, Josh Fox, whenever you are ready. All right. Da, da, da. And can we all see the screen? Yes. All right. So, present to you a story of secret banjo love. The love tale of love and or loves in the civilian conservation corps. Now this banjo was purchased at a garage sale uh, in Tioga County, uh, which is the county next to our museum, in 2018 for 25 cents. Now it wasn't too much about this banjo, but if you look closely on the, the head of the banjo was written a name and an address. And on there it says, Olene Negley, Westfield PA, box 314, CCC Company, 1384, Camp 91, Wetrunis, Pennsylvania. So that was a, a local boy, Westfield is Tioga County, and he served in the Civilian Conservation Corps at a local camp. Wetrunis is also in Tioga County, so he did not have to go far for his stint in the CCC. A little bit about the banjo. It's a Supertone number 503 banjo. This Supertone was the house brand for the Sears and Roebuck Company. Uh, you could have purchased it in, through a mail order in their catalog. So you see a couple images from the catalog there. The 1927 model, which kind of resembles the one we have, retailed for $7.45, which is equivalent to about $110 a day. So this was definitely a budget line instrument and something that would not be out of place for someone who might have found themselves in uh, some hard times during the Great Depression. Now, Orlean was at Camp 91, which is also known as Painter's Run. This camp was, um, the men of this camp helped develop Colton State 
uh, Colton Point State Park on the west rim of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon uh, here in Tioga County. And the park closed not too long after that park, uh, the camp closed not too long after the park opened in 1936. So said Owen didn't have to go far. Camp 91 was only about 20 miles from Westfield. Now we don't know much about Owen, just his address off of the banjo. So we don't know exactly when he was at the camp or even what he looked like. It's very possible he could be in this photo right here. These photos are from the Nick uh, Cassell collection, but it's of the same camp. Now, the, how this banjo relates to love is, when we took apart the banjo, there was a secret message that we found inside. Inside the banjo, I love is written several times. Now the names are illegible, but some of them have been crossed out. Some of them haven't, which really makes you wonder just how many women were serenaded by the sweet twang of Erlang's banjo playing. Probably quite a few, judging by how many loves there are on this banjo. Of course, keep to keep it secret so that they may never know. Now, Love in the Civilian Conservation Corps, singles only. Only unmarried men, 18 to 25, are permitted to enroll in, enroll in the CCC. Now, the exception was that there were veterans camps that had World War I veterans. They were older. They could be married men. But for the most part, only single men were allowed to join. And so these men had a chance to, to mingle with local ladies in nearby towns. Oftentimes, dances or other events were arranged. Here, Company uh, 302 of the Civilian Conservation Corps out in East Strasburg, they organized a dance, and it's the second annual one. So, Popular was trying to meet up some ladies in town to go dancing, but you didn't need to wait for that. As we see in this Lyman Run Ripple advertisement, the camp paper for the um, CCC camp at Lyman Run, which would be very close to Camp 91, that the Gelton Theater advertised at showtimes. So maybe you've met a girl in town, take her to a theater, afterwards take her to the sweet shop to get some sweets. Makes a you know, nice date for a nice young lady. I know. Go for it. And my slideshow seems to have. Oh, we were going so well. Stand by for technical issues. PowerPoint just couldn't take all that romance. Apparently not. <laughs> oh, it was such a good presentation too. I, I, nice <laughs> I can see it if you go back to the, um, just the regular, not in the slideshow, but the, the creation phase, I could see your slides then. Is it just stuck? Yeah, it does seem to be just, the whole thing just seems to be stuck. I guess you ran out of bandwidth. I'm going to blame the ice storms. Yeah, apparently. Well, 
Well, do you want to just uh, finish without the slides, and then uh, if they come back, we can break into them later? Sure, I guess so. Basically, did a little digging into Olean. Can you even see me anymore? Yes. Okay. Digging into Olean. Turns out that he did end up getting married in 1934 to uh, Ethel Tree, another uh, relatively local girl. For, hopefully, her name was one of the ones on the banjo. And, uh, I, you know, the end of it is hopefully a happy tale. All right. Yeah, I hate to keep everybody in suspense as to what happened to old McGeely, but uh, <laughs> it looks like technical difficulties. It, uh, it does. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if you can get that back up, let me know if you, if you want to finish that uh, last couple slides. Uh, but in the meantime, we will start uh, with Q&A. So uh, I know there was one in the uh, the Q and A for old economy, uh, Sarah. I guess you answered that. Yeah, I didn't know if everyone else could see that. See the answer. So the question was, um, did Frederick uh, Frederick Canadler come back from California, or did she go to him? How long was he away from old economy? Um, so Frederick was in California for about a year and a half, and um, he came back to economy afterwards, and they finally got married um, when Christiana turned 18. They waited three whole years. They had to move, move away to nearby Evans City. It takes um, somewhere around 40 minutes to get there by driving these days, um, but because the th they got married and that was discouraged, so they had to move away, but they were called back not too long afterwards, like a year later, um, to come back and tend the 100 acre farm, which is now the whole half, um, southern half of Ambridge, modern day Ambridge. <clears throat> right, we have a, a general question about Hope Lodge from Maureen. She was wondering what the origin of Hope Lodge is. You're still on mute, Helen. Sorry, I lost no my. Uh, so Hope Lodge, um, in terms of origin, the house was built um, in 1743 to 1748. Um, Samuel Morris was the Quaker uh, owner. He was a businessman. He had several um, different industries that he, he had his hand in. Um, over the years, Hope Lodge was uh, owned by five different families total, uh, all the way up through the 1950s by William and Alice Dean, who were the last private owners of Hope Lodge. Um, I'm not sure if that's answering the origin piece of it. Um, is there, if there's another follow-up question I can answer for you, I'd be happy to do that. Not sure uh, if we'll, chat. We will see what comes through. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. Brenda's wondering, uh, was the Pensbury petticoat donated by uh, Phoebe's family? And did it stay in her family? Yes, it stayed in her family for the entire time, which makes it such a wonderful piece. I mean, there are so few pieces of clothing from that are 300 years old that are handed down practically intact. You know, they're the two minor changes. So to be handed down, to have that intact piece of clothing 300 years old with minor changes with a provenance knowing who wore it when is just stunning um they loaned it to the um the family loaned it to the smithsonian it was on display at the smithsonian uh, museum of american history um, in the 1970s, and when that loan was due, uh, the family donated it to Pensbury Manor and the PHMC. Very nice. Yes, uh, Dee was wondering about uh, 
the uh, how Pope Lodge was uh, transferred after Samuel Morris died since he had no heirs? That is a very good question. Samuel Morris, uh, he had no heirs, had no will, actually. His will was actually partially written, and it actually, the house went to his uh, brother, uh, Joshua Morris, who was the executor of the estate. So um, his brother took over the house, and then the um, West family owned it next, and um, it was then sold to um, subsequent families over the years. It had, the name Hope Lodge came from the third family, the Watmau family. Um, James Horacio Watmau was the nephew slash ward of Henry Hope. And that's the um, family that owned the Hope Diamond, the famous Hope Diamond that you'd see down in the Smithsonian. And then uh, just to follow up, sorry, Joshua Morris, um, that trust is actually still in um, existence today. And the Joshua Morris trustees actually still give money to Hope Lodge um, to continue on with the educational endeavors. Very nice. Any other right. questions for our right. panelists? Try this again. You're unmuted. Did you have something? Yeah, I can try this again. Okay, you have a connection again? Want to finish it out? Go for it. Okay, so here we are. Finding the love at last. Said Doug and Ancestry was able to find a marriage license. Fortunately, I'm looking for Olin Nagley and not John Smith. So <laughs> I think I was able to find it. And it does say that he married Edith Treat on March 16th, 1935. And you can see down here his occupation was listed as CC work. So I'm pretty sure I found the right guy. But sometimes you got to question stuff. If you're a young man in the CCC, sometimes why choose love? You can have all sorts of names and plenty of space on those banjos. You have a, a foot locker here from Camp S88 Lyman Run with a nice selection of uh, lovely ladies and a couple of comments from the Hysterical History, which was a, a little publication that could be purchased to as sort of a yearbook of your time in the Civilian Conservation Corps. So just ending with those little tidbits. Now you're muted. Josh Roth, you're muted. I did it too. Uh, thanks, Josh. I'm glad technology finally came back on your side <laughs> and you were able to finish that out. Uh, we had a question from uh, Ruth Ann and Charlie uh, for Sarah. How is it possible for a couple to live married in old economy when it was a celibate society? It was possible because they were not members of the Harmony Society. The Harmony Society, basically, the members sort of took an oath that they weren't going to um, have children. And they, they, um, they had to get divorced from their, um, their um, spouse if they joined the society. So these were not hired workers. So they could they could live that way. So they were part of the community, but not necessarily part of the society. That's right. All right, uh, Josh Fox, uh, if you don't know the answer to this, I think I do. Uh, what prompted the curators to look inside of the banjo? It seems like a hard place to write messages. Uh, yeah, so that came before my time, but I would guess it's just part of the processing um, the, the process to, to add it to the collection. It was just um, taken apart for treatment and for um, cataloging and it was just kind of what it would be my guess. So yeah, um, I was here when the banjo came in. Um, the banjo was actually purchased. Uh, it's not something that we would normally take uh, because it was purchased at a secondhand store in Westfield. So uh, Olin McGeeley's address was in Westfield. Westfield's in Tioga County, maybe half an hour, 35 minutes from the museum. Uh, and a gentleman purchased it there, saw on the banjo that it had, you know, 
information about the CCC camp on it and brought it to the museum to donate. So uh, the, the information written on the banjo, you know, directly linking it to the CCC was the only reason that we, we actually decided to bring that into collection. Uh, and when it came in, because it was in a secondhand store, it was quite dirty. So <laughs> it was taken apart so that it could be clean. And uh, when, when we, there's a, just a wing nut on the back uh, that allows the whole uh, resonator plate on the back, the, the wooden plate to come off. And uh, as we were cleaning it up, we saw there was more writing on the inside. So it was very interesting, a pleasant surprise. Uh, even, you know, you think you're, you're getting just a little bit of information about this guy with his name and address. And then on the inside, you have a whole bunch of other stuff that you never expected to find. So. It was very cool. Uh, we have another, just a comment that says, uh, thank you folks for the interesting presentation and sharing of your knowledge. That's from Warren. Uh, you were very welcome. I, I think I speak for everyone here when we say uh, these programs are a lot of fun. So um, any other questions? If not, uh, we will open it up uh, for voting. Uh, I will give a quick shout out to uh, Jen Royer, who is our reigning champion. Uh, she won uh, January's virtual collection showcase uh, that was winter and cold weather with her undertaker's sled from the Landis Valley collection. So uh, we will open it up for voting and see uh, who wins tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, please choose your favorite. So which of these objects uh, best represents the theme of love and relationship? Each of our panelists can choose one. So we will let everybody click in. And uh, when I see that uh, everyone has had a chance to vote, I will share the results. If you have any last minute questions or something else comes to mind as we're waiting, uh, please, please feel free to put those in the chat. Again, I encourage you to uh, please visit those uh, uh, websites for our six sites and museums. Visit the donation links uh, if you are able. And uh, remember to be on the lookout uh, once we get the uh, date nailed down uh, for the post-it March Virtual Collection Showcase. That'll have to do with the theme of birthday and celebration. Uh, that collection showcase will be the week of Charter Day, which is essentially Pennsylvania's birthday. So that's why we went with the theme that we did of birthday and celebration. Uh, we're celebrating Pennsylvania. So. Ah, yes, uh, we've had this come up before. What if there are two of us watching? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to create any uh, stress in your household <laughs> if you're of a different mind as to who uh, had the, the, the best presentation. The way the webinar is set up, we can only accommodate one response per account. So um, at this point, uh, I think we have a pretty clear winner. We have 29 of 31 people who have voted. Uh, the poll has been open for just about two minutes. So I'm, I'm assuming that everyone that uh, had inclination to vote has had the opportunity to do so. So uh, with that, I will say congratulations. The belt is changing hands tonight. Sorry, Jen. Uh, congratulations to Sarah Buffington at Old Economy Village. Those coded love letters were very cool. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'll tell their grand grandson. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that does it for us. Thank you all for tuning in. Congratulations, Sarah. You will get to choose a theme of your choice for a, a future iteration of this program. Uh, I hope everybody had a good time. I know I did. Thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, great job all around. Uh, wonderfully interesting objects related to the theme of love and relationships. And uh, uh, I hope everyone uh, stays warm and uh, <laughs> has a good rest of their week. I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, we'll say until next time.